Hey everybody, Neil back with something a little bit different today. I'm going to dissect the classic scenario, the Niskemi Biscari Highway from Yanks, and I'm going to look at it from both the German and American perspective. So let's dig into it and see what makes this scenario tick. Here we are in the peaceful and idyllic countryside of Sicily shortly after Operation Husky where the Allies come ashore on the beaches of Gela and I don't know how many days it is it's very close to uh, Operation Husky kicking off and the Americans are pushing uh, inland and the Germans are trying to cut off access from the beaches and and hold them off as they push inland and that's what uh, the Niskemi Biscari Highway uh, details in this scenario but first let's go through the scenarios and kind of the genesis of uh, this scenario the scenario originally came out in uh, the general back in late 80s early 90s somewhere in there uh, as scenario E it's a cross of iron scenario that was published in the general and i remember playing it back in the day back in the early 90s um playing it and it sort of became kind of a instant classic it's it's a really well done scenario it's fun there's various ways you can set up or do a plan of attack and or defense even though the the map and playing area and the amount of units is uh fairly small then that scenario um, was converted into uh, a full ASL scenario, probably in the early 90s, 92, and published as scenario T9, I think, in the general. It became a tournament scenario. Um, and that existed for, what, 30 years from 92 or whatever to 2022 when Yanks reprint version 3a came out which is the most current version i forget what year that came out maybe 2021 somewhere in there um and it was unchanged as far as i know and it was updated to be scenario number 178 included in yanks which is rightfully the best place for it to reside because it is such a classic scenario and the only way you could get it before is find it online in an old pdf of the general or have a friend who has it so now you can get it in uh, Yanks Module 3A. So let's look at the look at the differences in the scenarios real quickly. So here's Scenario uh, E, which is the Cross of Iron version, and over here I've got Scenario 178. There's not a huge difference between the two. The one that stands out the most from me is uh, the American paratroopers in Cross of Iron or squad leader, I forget where the paratroopers were introduced. Um, they are eight four sevens. Uh, a squad with eight firepower. It's interesting to note also that the, the counters here only have two uh, soldier silhouettes because half squads didn't exist yet in Cross of Iron. I can't remember if it, they were introduced in uh, Crescendo of Doom or GI Emblem Victory, but they did not exist back then. You had either a full squad or no squad. They died when squad was eliminated, it's gone. But they were 847, which is crazy to me that you had eight firepower. And that's a huge difference from the updated version, which has seven four sevens from the ASL system. That one firepower, a uh, squad by itself, unless you use the incremental fire table, infantry fire table, is an entire column of firepower. So that one firepower is a huge difference in uh, American firepower in this scenario. Uh, other than that, the mine factors are a little different, 12 versus 10. The uh, Americans get some dummy concealment counters. I think they get one more bazooka in the updated version. Now oh, they get two extra bazookas in the updated version because I think bazookas in in ASL, um, as opposed to uh, Cross of Iron, are a little more powerful. I think that, or sorry, in Cross of Iron, they're more powerful back in the day. I think they're a little less effective in the ASL version, so they gave them three. Leadership uh, is a little better. Same number, just a little bit better quality. 
And then if we look at the Germans, they substituted a ar different armored car. It's essentially the same. The ASL version has a little bit better uh, coax machine gun. And you can see the armor factor 3-1 in full ASL versus cross of iron. They, the armor factor system was completely different back then, the way they carried out two kills. It's minus four, minus five versus three and one on this armored car. And uh, eight, four, six, sevens in the old version, same. The German units, they're pretty much the same, except the machine gun is dismantled and one less light machine gun. But I believe the victory conditions are the same. You have to control uh, some buildings. See the old version, you have to control two of the three buildings. Yeah, victory conditions are, are basically the same. So the translation from cross of iron scenario to full ASL scenario, some minor tweaks had to ma be made because the system evolved to be a little bit different between the two. Uh, but this is the one we're going to be talking about scenario 178 here today. And uh, that's kind of the genesis of the scenario. And it was designed by uh, Jim Stoller. And uh, everything else is the same. So let's jump into the uh, analysis. Let me switch to the map. I will make myself magically disappear. And we'll start doing some tactical analysis. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to start with just the bare map. And we're going to talk about setup areas, entry areas uh, for both sides, the Germans and the Americans. Um, plans of defense, plans of attack, potential plans that you can take. And then I will put the units up on the board to reflect uh, the scenario as we last played it uh, in this log file from couple years ago I can't remember uh, when we played it and how we set it up and how we played it out then I'm gonna step through the log file I'm not gonna talk about every gory detail but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop at the end of every turn it's eight turns I can't remember if we went a full eight turns I think we did it came down to you know last minute dash here at the end to see who won but at the end of each turn game turn I will stop it and we'll do a quick little tactical discussion about what happened and what might happen going forward after that. And then we'll skip to the end of the next turn and do the, do the same thing. So let's talk about the Germans first. Uh, up here we have their armored car. Um, and it's one of the most important pieces of equipment they have because it's extremely mobile. Unless you get off-road, then it gets a little bit slower because the movement points you have to spend while not on a road if you're in open ground but it's still incredibly important because the germans can use it to put firepower down it's got 11 firepower combined between infantry fire equivalent and its uh, coax and ext extremely mobile and it can get behind the american units and wreak havoc if the americans allow that to happen now the germans have to enter on one side of the board or the other they have to enter on the right side here or the left side here. They can't cannot split their forces. And one of the special scenario rules says that the American forces cannot fire on German entry hexes, which makes sense. Um, they can't really see this one here, the Americans, but they could put fire down on that hex, uh, entry hex, and complete create complete havoc um, the Germans as they come on, meaning the Germans would literally never choose to come in on that hex. They would always come in over here instead. So that's a good special scenario rule that was added. Now the Germans, what are their options if they come on on the uh, left or the right? So let's look at if they come in on the right. The natural way they're going to going to approach is they're not going to come up out of this gully. They're not going to risk running through all this open ground, maybe running through those grain fields to try to either capture, uh, I should mention that, the buildings that need to be captured are two of those three buildings need to be captured. So the Germans aren't going to risk to get to these back buildings. They're not going to risk coming out of this gully, running across a bunch of open ground and trying to do something like this, or at least get to this building, because it's almost certain 
the Germans are going to capture that building. And the Americans probably want to think about giving that up at the beginning because they're going to lose it. So what the Germans, if they come in on the right, then their natural way they're, they're going to come on, and probably the way that most people come on if they choose the right, is they're going to come in and do something like this, right? Or they may bring some units around through the gully. This part here is going to be a little slow going, so more than likely they're going to take this first option. They're going to come in. They won't get fired on here. They'll creep up through the gully, come into these woods, maybe come across like this as well. So that's option one coming on the, on the right. Now the armored car might come in. It's got to come in on the same entry area. It might choose to come in and do bypass like this. It also might choose to do these options. But it's unlikely to come in like this and go through the gully. Going through the gully is going to slow it down and it's going to expose its underbelly to fire attacks as it comes out. There are really only three areas where it can come through. It could potentially, I guess, the armored car could come in here and do bypass, come in here and do, pipe, do bypass, right? But essentially the German armored car, its choke points are going to be here and here if it wants to get into the back of the Americans in, in the, any timely manner. As the American defender, those are the places I'm going to look at. Whether they come in on the left or the right, the Germans, those are the two areas I'm probably going to concentrate on. And if, uh, if the Americans are covering this area here, that means they probably are able to cover this as well. So those two black area uh, regions are a concern for the Americans to cover going forward. The other option for the Germans is to come in on the right, which is probably the path of least resistance, the easiest, the less risky, because their path, you can directly come down like this and get access to two, two of the buildings, right? And as I discussed, that is almost certainly going to fall. And it's much, much easier to come in this way bring your units into these tree lines and come in like this and then work your way down like this through the wheat field into the, this bottom building and go for those two. This is probably what I would consider a third option, the highest risk option for the Germans to uh, capture two of the three buildings. Almost certainly these two are going to be the main targets for the, for the Germans. And as the Americans that's the ones I would protect the most. With a fallback being once this building is lost, you fall back to this building because this building is probably not under much risk. There's two ways the Germans could use their armored car. They could keep it behind this line and use it for suppressing fire with his infantry fire equivalent and its coax machine gun. Problem is, a lot of the line of sight is blocked, especially when you get over on this side. The other option is get it behind American lines. But the problem is doing that is you have to go through those choke points. And the Americans have quite a bit of anti-tank weaponry. They have three, was it three bazookas and two captured Italian 47 millimeter anti-tank guns. Now the captured anti-tank guns are being op operated as captured equipment. The Americans have two crew, so they're not, they don't suffer uh, non-qualified use, but they do suffer captured equipment penalties, which means a little bit harder to hit, and I believe the rate of fire goes down by one, so they're going to have a rate of fire of two. But still, that's five anti-tank weapons that you have to deal with trying to get through. If you want to get to the rear lines, getting through these, these choke points here to get to the rear. So doing that, which would be ideal for the Germans to get, that, get it back to the rear, is a pretty tall order in my opinion. So the Germans need to be very careful how they utilize their armored car in this situation. Now let's look at the American options. Uh, they essentially, well, their, their main thing they should be focused on are, as I just mentioned, their anti-tank weaponry. Taking out that armored car is critical uh, in my opinion because it can wreak a lot of havoc both in firepower and for route paths if it, it somehow gets behind you. So the Americans have to strategically place their three bazookas, their 12 mines, whether that's anti-personnel mines or converted to anti-tank mines, and placement of their captured 
anti-tank guns. So let's look at some options for the anti-tank guns. To cover the right side, one natural place to put it would be FF1. You can cover the entire gully by placing its covered arc, something like that. As an alternative, you can place it in CC1 and its covered arc would be something like that. And you could cover the gully and the bypass area here, or you could also place it there and have the covered arc going this way, covering these bridges. Uh, AA1 and BB1 are also good uh, alternatives. They could cover a wide swath like this, depending on which hex you place them in. In fact, putting an anti-tank gun on the right side of the board, kind of on this side, is probably the preferred side, at least one gun, maybe both, uh, because it's it's much more open. You start putting it over on, on this side of the board, and your shots at the armored car, which is what they're there for, you're not going to get much effect on, on infantry, German infantry. They're there to take out the armored car. You start putting them on the left side of the board, you're running into block line of sights, hindrances, and that sort of thing to increase your shots against the armored car. Let your bazookas on the left side take care of the armored car if it chooses to come through that way. And the last place you can probably put an anti-gun, anti-tank gun is kind of a last ditch location would be somewhere in here, either behind the hedge or in these buildings, one of these buildings, two of them, them are victory condition buildings. Problem there is you're in a building. If you want to fire outside your covered arc, you're going to have to pay a penalty to do so. So if you place them in those buildings, make sure you point them in the direction you expect the germ is to be approaching from. But those are also valid locations for the gun. Let's talk about mines, 12 firepower factors of mines. You can place them all 12 in one hex or divide it into two six firepower, six firepower hexes or convert them to anti-tank mines. I don't recommend that option because you've got essentially five anti-tank weapons already. I recommend using your 12 firepower factors of mines as anti-personnel mines and placing them accordingly. Placing the anti-personnel mines is a little tricky because you don't necessarily know exactly where the Germans are going to come. A fair guess is they're going to come somewhere through here, right? But if they, if they come all along this way and you put a bunch of mines over here, they're probably going to be wasted. But if the Germans come in like this, and you place all of them through here, they're probably going to work out fine. So it's a tricky prop proposition. In addition, you don't want to place them in critical areas where you know that your American units are either going to withdraw from, have to route through, or have to move through in the last second to uh, get out of harm's way. So I do not recommend putting them in X1. That's probably going to be at least a temporary fire base for your units before you decide to bail out because the Germans are probably going to capture that. Don't put any mines in, in X1. That could, that could turn out as a disaster. Your best bet is to put them in places where you're going to funnel, force the Germans to funnel their units, which is probably going to be on the periphery. So places like, assuming you don't place American units in there, would be in these hexes and these hexes, perhaps in one of these buildings, even R1 on the edges. That's where I would place mines. I would not waste my time putting mines anywhere this far over on the right. The Germans are not going to, infantry is not going to approach down this path. Last ditch effort, just like the guns placed down here in the rear, is, you know, you surround your one or both of your victory condition buildings with uh, some mines whether they be here or here or here, something like, like that. Taking into account that you might need to get into them as you retreat away from the Germans to cover your tracks. Now, as far as American infantry forces, lots of options here. You can set, uh, I believe they have to set up on the bottom board here. So you can set up far forward uh, in these locations, or you can set up some of your units here with fallback positions being cognizant of where you put your mines, obviously, with a plan to fall back through the grain into these buildings and or into this building. Because one of those two, one of these two buildings is probably going to be your Alamo. It's probably going to be your last stand to prevent the Germans from uh, satisfying the victory conditions because uh, this building will fall. So with that being said, let's uh, let me reveal the units and let's see how it played out when we played this scenario a few years ago. 
All right. As you can see here, the Germans are going to play the left gambit. More than likely, they're going to come in. They have to come in on this hex. They're all going to come in behind here and deploy essentially down like this, creating a gigantic fire group that's going to try to soften up the Americans or cover their way across this road. The armored car is probably going to come on. And I know what happens. But its options are to come across the bridge or come over here and do go through the gully or, or bypass. That's basically what the armored car is going to do. As you can see here, the Americans set up a frontal. They have very few units in the back. All of their units are dummies and otherwise are right up on the front of board four, everything. You can see the uh, Americans put one captured Italian gun there with its covered arc like this. The other one is back here with its covered arc like this to cover basically the green field and this approach and I assuming I, I played the Americans, so I'm not assuming <laughs> to cover the gully and potential bypass situation there for the armored car to get around and sneak into the rear. Bore side of hexes are this hex just coming out of bypass because the armored car, if it does choose to bypass, it has to bypass G4, whatever that hex is there. So it's got to come like this. So it's got to enter that hex. So I bore, bore side of that hex. Then I bore sight of this hex right in the middle of the wheat field for the approach to this uh, victory condition building there. I also chose to surround this victory condition building and this gun with six firepower minefields right there. This was going to be, uh, I pretty much knew I was going to lose this building. This building I ignored, like they can have it. This area was sort of set up to be my Alamo. And if I had to react back to this one to defend it, which I didn't think they would go for because there's just too much open ground to go through to realistically catch or capture this building here. But I could shift back if I needed to. This here, this was my Alamo for this scenario. We were able to set up uh, a unit hidden. So I put a bazooka with, a, I believe, a half squad there hidden. Cover this field and redeploy back if I needed to, if nothing approached over here. Then I have a bazooka, I believe, here and here to cover, you know, this area or bypassing and this area for the armored car to get through there. Other than that, I have my paratroopers basically distributed all through here with a consumer counter here and there to make it look like the stack's a little bit bigger than it should should be. I believe my main leader, uh, the 9 minus 1 or my 9 minus 2, whichever it is, is in that hex there. So let's step through to uh, the beginning of, through turn 1 to the beginning of turn 2 and see how it went. So here we are, beginning of turn 2. Not a whole lot has happened. You can see up top here, probably just off, he brought his armored car in like this playing a very conservative i think he's i think he, he might have taken a shot over here and pin those guys other than that his germans have come in just like i thought he would come into this tree line and they're going to push across the street to try to get into this tree line and eventually this building they did break a unit here so that's a, a start for the germans other than that not much has happened uh, turn two, end of turn two, beginning of turn three will be much more interesting. Let's uh, step through that. Now. Okay, we're at end of turn two, beginning of turn three. The Germans have pushed across the road here. I've kind of given it to them. They have a lot of firepower. Uh, other than these guys that broke off over here, and I think one of them is a half squad. They have a lot of firepower, so I'm kind of I'm falling back. Sometimes the best strategy is not to go for the kill; it's just to go for the delay. If you can slow down, depending on the victory conditions, if you can slow down your opponent, that sometimes that's enough. They they won't be able to get to all the victory conditions, and you'll end up winning. It doesn't matter if you kill zero squads or ten squad. If there's no victory casualty victory point, 
uh, condition to the victory conditions, delaying sometimes works just fine. So I've, I've kind of fallen back. He did break my leader here, my nine minus one or nine minus two. And I fell back into the one of the victory condition buildings there. I still have my bazooka here because I wasn't sure what he was going to do with his armored car, but he uh, swung it around over here. And you can see it is in bypass now. It's bypassing the woods and it's bypassing that hex side. That's as far as he could get. So I know he's going to has to come out and drive right into this hex that I bore sighted. And I'm looking forward to it because if I can take out that armored car, that will be a big deal. Now, the plan for the Americans is going to be fall back slowly, as slow as I can. You give up that building here as late as possible, fall back through the wheat, and fall back here to my Alamo. Maybe, you know, into these woods uh, if I can get in there. And I'll keep an eye on this building. I don't think he's going to do anything with it because all of his Germans are concentrated over here. And he just has this uh, token squad or half squad there running through the open. Okay, let's clear this and I will go to, or I'll step through turn three. Okay, we're now through turn three, beginning of turn four. The German armored car came through here during its last movement phase, and I must have defensive fired from the anti-tank gun that was here. Got up here, must have got a good roll, primarily helped by the, the boar-sided hex, and actually got a kill on the armored car. And then, as you can see, during my the American movement phase, I say my because I played the Americans, I didn't figure the, the Italian gun was going to do much use over there. The armored car was taken care of. All the Germans are over here. I'm going to start hoofing that gun down the road, which is exactly what I did. What I, did. I push it out of the woods, and I start pushing it down this road to get it you know, somewhere in here, depending on what the uh, Germans are going to do. I spend, you know, half the rest of the game pushing that thing down the road, but it, eventually it worked. Uh, the Germans are a lot more spread out now. They took a couple breaks. They had to fall back to these woods here. Same with me, the Americans. They're a little more spread out. I had to give up this, this line here, fall back across the road while I could for my plan to go down through the wheat here. I'm still holding on to this building here. I think I killed one of the American or German half squads there as he was trying to get it run into this gully. I think I did got a KIA on one of them. And then uh, I think this is just a, this is a dummy stack of concealment counters there. Let's step through turn four and see how it progresses. Ooh, the Germans are they are trying to outflank me here. You can see uh, Scott's pushing on my left flank. He's going to, I'm in a, I'm kind of in a world of hurt here in the center, but he's going to come down and try to pull uh, a tricky maneuver like this while, while most of my Americans are occupied up here. A bunch of them broke or were actually eliminated. They got pounded pretty quick pretty good in this central area my nine minus one leader and a squad maybe a half squad is still holding on to that building my thinking is if i can get him to dump time and resources into taking that building even if i lose these guys uh, his german units that do that may not be able to even make it down there to get into the fight on this last building here meanwhile my anti-tank gun I push it down a little bit, and I, you know, I face the covered arc this way in case I had a shot at anything. But I'm going to continue to try to push it down the road to get it near this building here. Let's so do next turn. Okay, that was turn five. It's interesting to note that these Germans didn't really move. I fully expected him to come on this this arc on the left much faster than he did but i think he prep fired at uh, something i forget where it was to try to cut off maybe my uh my retreat path here 
that I'm doing. I, I can't remember if it worked, but it did significantly delay him doing his end run that I think he was trying to do. Meanwhile, 9 minus 2, Yulin is still basically guarding that building, and we're on turn 6. We're starting turn 6, and he's still... Germans are still, I mean, they're still quite a ways away from, you know, these last victory buildings. And uh, so far, they haven't captured any of them at this point. And Scott, my opponent, has three turns to capture two of those buildings. So at this point, even though I am, as the Americans, fairly beat up and spread out at this point, I think I have a pretty good hold on this area. And I'm not too worried about anything coming into this uh, building here. Heck, he may not even grab this building. I still have a 9 minus 2 and a squad and maybe a support weapon under there as well. Okay, let's do turn uh, 6. Okay, the Germans still spent a bunch of time messing around in this area, which is kind of what I wanted them to do. But they finally broke 9 minus 2 and the squad that was in there, basically freeing up this building. So they're going to get that. These Americans here are probably going to be eliminated at some point. I forget what happens to them. I'm, I'm sure they're eliminated. It looked like a, I got a hero. Something happened over here. I had a hero, and it looked like a fanatic unit pop out somewhere over here what i ended up doing was moving them back to this victory building and then taking the units that were in there and moving them down here to cover this as a backup he finally brought these units that were up here he brought them in like this the funny thing is is he he brought them in fairly close and then he he retreated he advanced back and i remember playing this that kind of surprised me because all i had was he didn't know the anti-tank gun was here and he doesn't know the mines are there, but I fired a crew, so he probably assumed the anti-tank gun was there, and I think it made him a little skitterish, plus I had this other stuff. I think he was going to wait for the remainder of his guys to reinforce them instead of jumping in and trying to take it, uh, get a hit on the Americans uh, as much as he could. But my Americans in just this entire area that was in here, they are devastated. They're broken eliminated, running back. And the only thing I have left is the guys that were here and here shifting like this to try to cover. It's going about as expected. We're, we're on turn seven and I'm still, technically I still have all three buildings. The, the Germans don't control any of them, but let's see how that progresses. So we're on the last turn. This is it. It says German's last movement turn. And they captured the building up here, eliminated all those guys. They really don't have a chance to get into this building. It's low. There's a broken unit in there, but I think there's still a fanatic in there. Their only real hope is probably getting to get to that building. And I've reinforced it. I have a hero down there. I have this gun pointing right into it. I have a squad in there. I left the American Broken Squad here. Got He's back under DM. But the Germans can't enter that building during their movement phase, right? Like I previously talked about. They're going to be forced to come around it, run through the minefields, or run through the open to get next to the victory condition building. That's my last, last hope as the Americans, and it's his last hope as the Germans. He's going to, on his turn, he is going to which is the top of the eighth, the Germans. He's going to bum rush the victory condition building. Hope he breaks stuff in advancing fire or jump into close combat and take it in close combat. My hope is this gun, these minefields, and this half squad here. It's getting down to the wire. Let's see how it ends. You can probably, probably predict how it ends the way I've been talking. Let's see how it goes. So I don't think he did any firing. He, it's, he went straight to movement phase. And he's bringing the squad in uh, just above my broken squad. Jumps into the minefield. Gets attacked. 
passes, I believe. This other guy comes down around, skirts around the minefield. Maybe he suspected at that point there was a minefield there in W9. But he gets fired on by, the, by those guys. Takes morale check. I have wall advantage, so he's moving in the open there. It's his you know, last ditch effort. Fails his morale check. Breaks. He's out of it. This guy probably runs, yep, right into the minefield, the other minefield. Gets attacked. Ooh, 11 morale check. He breaks. <laughs> So he comes around the other way, jumps into the residual fire, gets attacked, passes, but is pinned, so he's out of it. He can't advance into the victory condition building. Well, I roll a 12 on a subsequent first fire, I think. So I'm final fired. He moves his 9 minus 2 down through the wheat. I fire at from the build fire at him from the building in C6. I think I get a yeah, I roll snake eyes on the shot. Uh, I can't remember if there's a leader in there. There's a wounded leader, it looks like. And the squad breaks, but the leader continues on, runs into residual and minefield. I think he passes. Then I take a subsequent first fire. Then I fire the gun, the crap gun B, the Italian gun. Get a, I think it was a pin check, and he fails it, and he is pinned. And I believe that is the end of it. So it's interesting to note that one small, it might be an innocuous decision that didn't didn't really seem that like it would be that important. And it didn't dawn on me till the end, really, that what I had done had essentially won the, the games for the Americans. It was not routing that broken crew out of that building and deciding just to leave them there to force him to run through the minefields. I, I didn't know that it was going to play out that way. It just happened to work out that way, you know, a serendipity. And it basically saved the games for the Americans because he had a lot of guys running in, but they all had to run through essentially, not all of them, but most of them had to run through minefields and uh, residual fire in the open to uh, have an attempt to capture uh, the vic last victory condition building here. This one over here was never really a target, and then I left a token crew there just in case. But yeah, that's it came down pretty much to the wire, the last German uh, movement phase. This scenario, scenario 178, the Niskemi Biscari Highway, classic scenario. I think we played it a few times. There's lots of ways it can play out, lots of options for such a small scenario for it to play out. I highly recommend this scenario. I'm not sure what the balance is on it. I just checked the balance. It's about 100, I think, American wins to 90 German wins. So pretty bit balanced scenario, very fun scenario. Uh, so, okay, that's it. That's the end of the tactical analysis for scenario 178, the Niskemi Biscari Highway. I had fun doing it. I may do more of these in the future. I just thought I would do this one because uh, I was looking at the log file the other day. I thought, well, it may be, be fun to do a tactical analysis video on this scenario. I have lots of log files, Vassal log files. So this would all be on Vassal. I'd, you know, draw on my screen to show what I'm thinking and what the possibilities are for either side and how it played out real quickly. But I think I might do more of these in the video in the future, probably just based on log files of scenarios we played. Maybe you'll see more of these in the future. It depends on how much time I have. But for now, I had a lot of fun doing this. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed watching it. And we'll see you in the next video.